In our Dragons of D&D series, we have so far covered a white dragon, a blue, a green dragon, and also a draculich. I do like the idea of covering at least one of each color to start with, to get a very nice variant of characters here, just so that we can get a little bit of everything. Though I will say now, we will most definitely cover multiple red dragons, because there are some bangers here. Some really famous red dragons that you will most definitely will want to know about. Dragons that have appeared multiple times throughout the history of the Forgotten Realms and will most certainly appear within your very own 5e adventures. And today we're covering one such dragon, the ancient red dragon Cloth. If the green dragon Clogi Liamatar was known as an adventurer slayer, well, Cloth is known as a dragon slayer. His nickname is Old Snarl because of all of the massive scars that he has all over his body and face, which forces him to have a, a resting grim looking face that looks like a snarl with his teeth bared. As scars he got by slaughtering many a dragon in his time. He lairs in a fairly large region called Clothenvale, right here in the spine of the world, mountain range. Clothenvale, of course, named after him, for him being the only real thing that can exist freely in that area. His greatest treasure is a powerful spell. It's said to be so powerful that Kilvin Arinson, the previous Blackstaff of Waterdeep, once said that if any mage were to get his hands on that spell, Calvin himself would be forced to gather the might of Waterdeep in order to kill that mage. Such is the power of this spell, but what spell is that? Well, before we get into that, guys, I am making a huge Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition adventure for characters level 1 to level 11. Sands of Doom, a massive army of 30,000 undead gnolls marches through the desert towards the capital city. Players are going to have to prepare as they travel across the small desert kingdom, just as war looms on the horizon. Gather allies, assassinate enemy commanders, spy and sabotage. The Great Siege of Al'Kirat is coming, with a huge chapter dedicated to the Great Battle. Fight through the battlements, into the streets and defend the markets. The salvation of the kingdom depends on you. Inspired by some of the best adventures of D&D's history and utilizing thousands of hours worth of research on lore and monster biology, I bring you Sands of Doom, the collection of all of my study and work put into a single campaign. Click the link below and check out the Kickstarter. We have an absolutely sick DM screen. We have poster maps for the big encounters of the campaign, cards for magic items, and even more monster classes. Instead of playing as a barbarian or a rogue, play as a troll, an earth elemental, or even a null. These are both races and classes with all 20 levels worth of features and even subclasses too. Support me and the channel by going onto the link below and checking out Sands of Doom on Kickstarter, a full Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition campaign. And now, onto the video. A cloth is something of an enigma, a mysterious red dragon that has never been fully understood. That is because, I suppose, the most apt description one could use for this dragon is that he is unpredictable. A cloth randomly appears, destroys his target, and then just as fast disappears into the mountains. That is his signature fighting style. He shows up and creates as much destruction as possible, only to simply run away before there is ever any chance at counterattacking. There are stories of Cloth mysteriously helping people out of the kindness of his heart, while the next day tearing an enclave apart with his raging claws. His personality has never been described as erratic, but his desires are seldom understood, and unlike other great dragons of the north, attempting to speak with Cloth is considered to be a fool's errand. It is said that he has no acquaintances, no friends or any allies. He doesn't even keep minions on his lair. The lore is even very explicit about the fact that there is absolutely no record of him ever mating or having any positive interaction with any other form of dragon. In fact, what he does is he hunts those dragons. He murders them whenever he gets the chance. Out of the many dragons in the area, he's considered to be one of the most aggressive and successful when it comes to the number of victories he has had. 
Of course, victories over other dragons is not everything, but such victories have brought upon Cloth a lot of advantages, but also a series of unfortunate disadvantages as well. Uh, the greatest advantage is, of course, the legendary treasure that Cloth possesses. As such a trove comes from him defeating many dragons and subsequently stealing their treasure. The disadvantages, though, are very costly. Cloth has developed an exceedingly large roster of enemies, both from dragons that he failed to kill, but mostly from dragons who covet this legendary treasure. But le let's back up a bit. So, why is Cloth so strong in the first place? So we know, of course, that red dragons are naturally the strongest of the chromatic colors. An adult red dragon will typically triumph over an adult of any other chromatic color, be it black, white, green, or blue. Of course, that is just in theory, provided that all else is equal, but things are never equal in that way. Dragons are possessed of great magic, be it spells or magic items. Sometimes they have allies, some are smarter than others, and sometimes strategy dictates that one dragon be better than the other. So. Uh, which one is it for Cloth? Well, in terms of physical might, the lore does describe Cloth as being particularly bigger than normal, like he's supposed to be humongous. So compared with another red dragon of similar age, at least in size, Cloth should be fairly dominant. Cloth is also described as being shockingly dexterous, which is not a description that you would generally attribute to dragons of this scale and size. But it is a feature of cloth that is brought up over and over and over again in the lore. An old Snarl is like a cat. Its reflexes are marvelous to behold. It flies very elegantly and graceful, unlike other ancient dragons. But more than that, its stealth is said to be really, really good. There are stories of cloth. Again, imagine an ancient red dragon the size of an enormous house successfully sneaking onto another dragon slayer and stealing their treasure without them knowing. Now, in terms of strategy, Cloth employs various hit-and-run strats that we described before. He will get a jump on a dragon and then attempt to kill them as fast as possible in, in something that can only be described as a form of assassination, before quickly getting what he needs and then leaving. His attacks are meant to be overwhelming. Further, much like Clogili Amatar, Cloth is an expert at scrying magic, but unlike Clogili Amatar, he's not obsessed with anything in particular. Instead, he uses this ability to scry against his enemies to formulate his battle plans. Quote, Cloth spends most of his waking time scrying the realms around him with his spells. He probably knows more about the deeds and whereabouts of surface world creatures in the Sword Coast North than any other being alive today. Moreover, Old Snarl thinks more about what he sees than most who spy by means of magic. He's seldom looking for just one thing or person, and he has the wits and experience in their use to assess problems and reason them through without hesitation. Seeing cards being loaded with swords in one spot sends him looking for activity among armorers in all the places to which those cards could logically be headed. A mustering of forces in a merchant company compound or noble villa brings his full attention to bear upon the purpose of that activity and the potential results." End quote. In essence, Cloth is extremely intelligent in how he uses the information that he obtains. Whether he uses it to better strategize his attacks or to barter that information with other creatures. There are, of course, beings that not even Cloth would want to fight against. In particular, fully fledged human cities in the north. And so, Cloth uses the intelligence he knows from that which he has scried upon, sometimes to threaten leaders, or to blackmail them, or to simply trade them in exchange for for peace when necessary. So as you can see, in terms of physical might, dexterity, and intelligence, Cloth is a bit above the rest, but that is, of course, not enough. I have mentioned this before, and, and I will do so again. For a dragon to reach ancient status, they need more than just being above average. You don't survive by simply being a little better. Where Cloth really excels at is actually magic. Now, he is no Imrith, that is for sure. In fact, Imrith is canonically stronger than Cloth, but Cloth is no slouch either. I, I bring up Imrith because one of the most powerful aces within Cloth's arsenal came from him actually stealing from Imrith. So, Cloth 
snuck into one of the many buried desert compounds of Imrith and stole a bunch of Netheris magic, which he then studied and perfected into a series of spells. Okay, so uh, magic is very complicated, of course. The, the process of casting a spell requires a lot of focus and your ability to be able to tap into the weave to access its arcane font. Uh, even when you use a spell scroll or a magical item, you still require a lot of effort. So generally speaking, a competent wizard uh, can cast a spell in about six seconds, which generally involves the weaving of the arcane sigils and the pronunciation of the correct magical words. Now, really powerful wizards are able to cast weaker spells much faster, but doing so most times would cost the wizard more of its arcane power. See, in 3rd edition, for example, wizards could quicken spells, which allowed them to cast a spell without needing an action, but that spell would then cost them 4 spell levels higher. So a wizard could cast, say, a magic missile spell instantaneously, but it would cost them a 5th level spell slot. In 5th edition, sorcerers can also quicken spells, spending sorcery points in order to cast them as a bonus action, but with the caveat that they can't cast any more spells of 1st level or higher, during that same turn. So yeah, casting a spell takes a lot of effort, and the same thing applies for using magical items. Typically it takes about 6 or so seconds for you to be able to activate a wand or really any other magical item in the same way. Well, Cloth developed a spell called Olonger's Enchanted Triptych. It is believed that Olonger was the name of the Archmage who originally developed the spell in the times of Netheril thousands of years ago, but regardless, the spell allows Cloth to simultaneously trigger three magical items that he is touching, carrying, or wearing. All of the magical items would operate on the same round and would be able to target different targets if desired. So what Cloth has done is he has mounted upon his wings a set of six different wands that he carries wherever he goes whenever he leaves his lair. On his left wing, he has a staff of frost, a staff of fire, and a wand of polymorph. While on his right wing, he has a wand of paralysis and two magic items that don't quite exist in 5th edition. One of them is a wand of lightning, which is meant to function just like the staff of frost and the staff of fire, but instead of like fire or frost spells, it is lightning based spells. The other would be a wand of flame extinguishing, which, as the name implies, is meant to extinguish magical and non magical flames. Uh, typically, Cloth would use this before using his wand of polymorph, so that the fire wouldn't damage the polymorph effect. But yeah, so this triptych spell is a 5th level spell that requires only a verbal component. And so by using this spell, Cloth can activate three of the magical items that he has bound on his wings. Many dragons have actually come to challenge Cloth, thinking that all they had to do was worry about his fire breath, only to then be torn apart by the lightning and the frost from his magical items. Based on studies that clerics of Mistra have done on the very concept of this spell, uh, they have surmised that if a human were to attempt to cast it, it would probably end up being an 8th level spell for us. Uh, this is something that I forgot to mention on the previous dragon videos. When I say a spell level for the spells that these dragons have access to, you have to keep in mind that those are for the purposes of the dragon casting the spell. Uh, dragon magic is slightly different than the arcane magic that humanoids use. And so what is a 3rd level spell for them might be a 6th level spell for us. Whereas a 9th level spell for a dragon might never be achievable for a human to, to master. Now, that is in fact not the only spell that Cloth is known for. Thellers are anew. This is the spell that truly makes Cloth the fearsome foe that it is. And also is in fact the very reason why Cloth fights the way he does. It is his greatest strength, but also his greatest weakness. See, Cloth is paranoid, obviously. I mean, all dragons of this age tend to be. Uh, Cloth in particular, though, he slays every dragon that he can, uh, just in hopes of limiting the potential number of rivals that he might have to deal with in the future. And a lot of these fights are actually not fights at all. Cloth does his best to hunt juvenile dragons, babies, and even eggs. In particular, he spends a lot of time scrying for dragons who are rearing eggs, just so that he can trick the mother into leaving the den and then go in and devour those eggs. But see, he does this for all kinds of eggs, except for red dragon eggs. Those 
Those eggs he keeps. He steals them and moves them over to his lair where he can then experiment with them and cast spells on them. Thellers are a new. In particular, is the spell that he has been using on them. This spell allows him to siphon the energy of the red dragon egg and then imbue himself with that energy, increasing his vitality, vigor, and might. This, okay, this is the key to Claude's power and the secret that he hoards from anyone else. The spell came from an old Netherese archmage who enjoyed experimenting on red dragons and would try and find ways to enhance them. Somehow, Cloth found and perfected the spell, no doubt from another raid at Imrith's Horde of Magic. Now, the spell is extremely powerful and has three effects. When Cloth sacrifices a red egg to it, he can either heal himself, empower himself, or recuperate all spent spell slots. Now, of course, healing is fantastic, and regaining all of your spent spell slots is particularly broken, but the one that I want to focus on is the empowerment option, because this, this is the one that really matters here. So in the lore, it is simply described as it increasing his size, health, and vigor. Elminster described it as it making the red dragon, quote, better. And the original Archmage who devised the spell used it to experiment and produce stronger variants of dragons, such as two-headed dragons, for example. Mechanically speaking, what happens is when the spell is done and the empowerment option is chosen, the dragon gains power as if it had increased one dragon size category. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if the spell was casted by a young red dragon, then he would gain the abilities of an adult red dragon. If he was an adult dragon, then he would gain the abilities of an ancient dragon. Now, the spell itself was designed by Ed Greenwood, who of course is the creator of the Forgotten Realms, and this was back in 2nd edition. So, in 2nd edition, an increase in dragon size category meant more armor class, breath weapon damage, more spells, more resistance to magic, more health, better hit modifier, longer radius for the fear aura. I mean, basically, everything would become better, which is also the same as in 5th edition. But back then, dragons had 12 age categories. Uh, here's a little table so that you can see all of them. Nowadays, we only have four. Wormling, Young, Adult, and Ancient. So each jump category is massively more impactful today than what it used to be. So this is something to keep in mind. However, the spell Thellers Are Anew also allows Cloth to sacrifice multiple eggs in order to multiply the effect. So he could, say, sacrifice three red dragon eggs in order to then jump three dragon size categories. So because back in the day we had 12 dragon size categories and now we only have four, we can deduce that each jump in size category now equals about three jumps in second edition. Now, a red dragon wormling is a challenge rating four. A young red dragon is 10, an adult is 17, and an ancient is 24. So using the average here, it seems that each increase in size category for red dragons in 5th edition means an increase of 6 to 7 challenge ratings. So to keep it simple, we can then deduce that for every single egg that Cloth sacrifices for this ritual, he increases his challenge rating by 2 points. Now according to the Dungeon Master's Guide, each increase in challenge rating at this stage, so generally being above a CR 20 basically, each individual increase in challenge rating increases your hit points by an average of 45 and the damage that you're supposed to do per round by an average of 18. So by sacrificing, say, 5 eggs, he would increase his hit points by an average of 225 and his damage would increase by an average of 20 points of damage per round. And that would put him at a challenge rating of 36 because he normally chills at a CR of 26 or I guess according to 5th edition, a CR of 25. Now, a challenge rating of 36 is obviously bonkers, though that is still not as high as Inferno, another red dragon in the area, but we will cover him, of course, in another video. Now, the biggest caveat of all of this, because so far this seems pretty broken, is that the empowerment effect will only last for 10 hours. And then after those 10 hours are done, Cloth will return back to normal. Now that you know this, does it now make sense why Cloth fights the way he does? Why he shows up 
creates untold devastation and then simply disappears as fast as he came is because he knows very well that he only has 10 hours of power before he goes back to normal. And so, like I said, this is a massive benefit to his strength, but also can become a huge detriment. Relying on borrowed power can have consequences, especially when one tackles challenges far above their pay grade. And as we know, Cloth has made a lot of enemies throughout his years. Quote, Cloth was sorely wounded on the fourth day of Mirchul in the year of the turret, when he was ambushed by two white dragons and a blue dragon working together. The four worms engaged in a spectacular aerial battle that raged across the skies of the Sword Coast North, from the Ice Flow to the Fail Pass. Though Cloth did slay all three of his attackers and wasted no time in seizing the horde of the vanquished blue dragon Eirdrithkrin, he then went into hiding. Elminster explains that according to an odd young apprentice mage who was practicing his scrying spells near Neverwinter, Old Snarl came out of that battle with one wing almost torn off and a great gaping hole on his side. Almost half of his body had been frozen solid, shattered, and then struck away. No one saw where the crippled worm flew, nor the landing that almost slew him. Cloth used all of his hoarded and freshly seized magic to keep himself alive and to build a lair in which to hide away and heal. He chose a narrow, winding chasm in the mountains east of Ravenrock, an unnamed, isolated valley that he filled with sheep, goats, and rothi seized from all over the north. There he yet abides among his ready supply of food, building his strength and practicing his spells, awaiting the day when he will be powerful enough to sally forth as the unquestioned master of northern dragonkind." End quote. This is actually why Cloth is not at the moment tormenting everything around the world. He just happened to have survived a massive attack against him and is now in the process of healing himself. Uh, dragons do take a very long time to mend their wounds, which makes sense of course. It might be years before Cloth feels comfortable challenging other mighty dragons again. Now, let's finish up by talking a little bit about Cloth's lair, though to be honest, there really isn't much to talk about. After his fateful battle against those three dragons, Cloth settled right here in what is now known as Clothenvale, and has made it his main lair for the moment until he fully recovers. The veil itself is said to be magically enchanted by old magic, though Though exactly where this magic comes from, it's very much unclear. The magic presents itself as a warming effect that maintains the veil at a comfortable temperature throughout the year, in spite of the otherwise freezing temperatures of the area. This allows the location to become something of a miraculous spring in an otherwise harsh environment. The cloth has spent the time to grab all manner of animals from all over the continent and drop them here in the veil to populate them, in order for him to, of course, have a sustainable source of food in the area so that he has no need to ever leave it. So that's the veil, but as far as the lair itself is concerned, we actually know nothing of it. All we know is that he keeps his horde on a series of tunnels by the veil, but the entrance to those tunnels are blocked by an enormous slab of rock that can only be moved by a creature with as much power as a giant dragon. Quote, Old Snarl is less likely to die by misadventure than most dragons. Enfeeblement, old age, disease, or a cabal of foes acting together are the dooms most likely to claim him. The last mentioned cause would probably involve a titanic battle. The others might strike silently, or might goad Cloth into one last grand suicidal flight of destruction across the north. In any case, once word spreads of the passing of Old Snarl, Clothenvale is likely to see a gold rush of adventurers hungry for wealth and mages hungry for magic like none other in the modern north. If even one of these seekers recovers an intact triptych spell, well, as Elminster has observed, twill be a mite too late then for the traditional tactic of standing back and looking the other way." End quote. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Do click the link below to go to the Kickstarter and check out my Sands of Doom 5th edition campaign. The campaign is only active for 30 days, so do not miss it. Also, if you want a soft cover book for your monster classes, you can only get it through the Kickstarter, so make sure to go around and browse. If you like the content, if you like the channel, then please consider supporting using the link below. 
Sands of Doom, now on Kickstarter. Link in the video description. Now, if you guys didn't check out the last video that I uploaded, which was my channel update, I am uh, finally quitting Patreon. So this is the last time that I'm going to thank my favorite Patreon supporters, Barry Maskan, 5e Magic Shop, Rusty Rain, Duck Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Culp, Falky951, Ordoric, Thomas Hunt, Solis Rider, Stalia, Trev909, Trevor Hess, The Living Guild Pack, The Wizard's Vault, Herbert Johnson, Shane and Sam Skinner. Stephen, Nacto Rashura, James the Perverted, Shuddycast, Creasy3, Lucas Syrek, Murden Games, John Harley, Sir Ignatius Thunderblade, Warren Smith, Wyvern Claw 00, Loa, Falcon Scientist, Richard Sawyer, Mavrath Master of Secrets, Lauren, Guy Broman, Spasak, and Lissward. Thank you so much for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. You guys are the GOAT. Thank you so much for supporting me all this time for all this months and some of you for years there's a lot of you here that have been supporting me since the middle of 2019 it's absolutely incredible thank you guys so much and uh, for one last time you guys are the best